great to see so many people here um, tonight. I'm just going to try to get the lights down. Here we go. Um, yeah, so I'm from the Imperial College Center for Cryptocurrency Research and Engineering, uh, which was set up in April 2015. And what we do there is we look at all aspects of the world of blockchains and distributed ledgers and so on. It's a phenomenon, a kind of a recent phenomenon, which has uh, sort of swept uh, pretty much all areas of our lives and the media and so on. So um, it's a subject, too, that is too big, I think, for just one person to manage and get their heads around, which is why in the center uh, we take a multidisciplinary approach and we try to get uh, people together uh, from uh, all sorts of different disciplines. So I myself, I have a background in computer science and statistics. Uh, Kathy Mulligan, uh, she specializes in economics and telecommunications. Uh, Rob Learney here, our associate director, who's in the audience down here, uh, he is, uh, specializes in healthcare. He's actually also a medical doctor. Um, Ian is one of the first people to introduce uh, Bitcoin to me. Many, many years ago, he came into my office, and he banged on my desk, and he said, well, you have to pay attention. Something very important is coming. Yeah? And I said, what is it, Ian? And he says, Bitcoin. And I said, what's that? Yeah? And now he doesn't need a job, and I do. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, and finally, uh, we have uh, uh, Andy. Andy is one of our MSc Computing Science uh, grads. He's actually, his first degree is in... Uh, physics from uh, Oxford, and then he did our uh, one-year uh, computing conversion course, essentially. And there's our website if you're interested in learning more uh, about us. Right? Uh, we coined the name uh, when Bitcoin was basically the only game in town, and it is a cryptocurrency. Uh, it is a virtual uh, sort of digital money, and, and the, hence the name. If we were doing it again, we would probably call it something like of the Center for Blockchain Research or something straightforward. Right? Um, so what do we try and do in the center? We've got three main uh, missions, as it says here. So first of all, we want to actually look at the fundamental protocols underlying um, this blockchain technology, and we want to improve them. There are severe barriers at the moment to the performance of uh, the blockchains that are out there right now. For example, Bitcoin. Uh, is only able to do uh, of the order of like three to seven transactions uh, a second. And if this is going to be a new global payment system, that's just not good enough, right? Uh, what else do we like to do? We try to get insights into the dynamic operations of these blockchains and also the associated markets. So every time someone invents a new cryptocurrency or a new kind of coin, a market springs up around it to enable people to trade it. Um, and that's one of the sort of interesting phenomena that we've noticed. Actually studying the dynamics of the blockchains themselves is also interesting. So we'll be having a look at, I hope, some visualizations of the Bitcoin uh, uh, blockchain, which illustrates some of the points around that. And finally, and very importantly, a big area of focus for us are to look at novel applications of this technology. And by that, we like to go way beyond just financial applications. And hopefully I'll, I'll show you some of those later. And also Alan and Annika will give you a demo of something, um, which will maybe show you the potential of, of the technology in non-financial domains. So in doing all of this, we really strive to interact with industry and uh, also with government, right? So I've been director of industrial liaison for the computing department since 2004, and some of the most exciting uh, projects and so on that we've been able to do have been with industry because uh, uh, the field is moving so fast right now. Right? We had an industry speaker in today who was talking about how much the field had moved forward since 2014. Uh, 2014. He said, way back in 2014, we used to do it like this. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, that makes me feel really old. <laughs> but it's true, the field is moving really quickly. Um, so why the fuss about blockchain technology itself? Well, it's summarized here. For the first time, we have a mechanism which allows untrusting parties who have common interests to co-create a record of exchange and processing 
um, of some kind of uh, asset uh, without relying on a central authority. That's a very big uh, point. And the CEO of Google has it right here when he says, essentially, what we've done with Bitcoin is crack the copy protection problem. Right? Uh, digital content is normally very easy to just duplicate and distribute around, whereas now we have the ability to make a digital tokens that are only exchangeable. They cannot be copied or double spent. Right? And people always talk about uh, if the internet was this wonderfully disruptive technology that held us, helped us to disseminate information, well, then the blockchain technology is going to be this disruptive platform that helps us to uh, exchange value. Right? And that's a very powerful kind of concept. You think, for example, of a licensing of software products. People have spent how long trying to come up with uh, copy protection mechanisms and so on for that problem, and yet now um, you can just, for example, issue someone a license, a token on a blockchain, and it, they can trade and exchange it, but only one person can use it at a time. So what is a blockchain? Um, I struggled a while to find a suitable diagram on the, uh, on the internet, and eventually I adapted somebody else's and added a few things to it. Right? So a blockchain is a chain of blocks. Right? Each block, <laughs> wait for it, it gets better. <laughs> right? Each block essentially records a set of transactions. Right? And each of these transactions is signed by the sender of whatever the uh, token happens to be. So this is the Bitcoin blockchain. So Alice, Chris, and Ed here will have signed those transfers of money uh, with their uh, private uh, keys. So we know it was definitely them, um, or at least somebody who has access to their private key, uh, making these transfers. Right? Uh, you will see um, that there's also these little swirly pictures here. This is a digital fingerprint. Right? This is what's known as the hash or digital fingerprint of, uh, of a block. It's a compact representation of the contents of the block, and if any of the contents change, that fingerprint will change. Now, in a normal ledger, for example, you would have uh, balance uh, uh, carried forward and balance brought forward and stuff, and this is the idea of these fingerprints. What they let you do is determine that the integrity of the data in this chain has not been uh, compromised. Right? So that fingerprint from the previous block will be stored in the current block. Right? And so on and so forth. So if any of that data changes, people will be able to instantly tell that uh, this chain has been uh, tampered with. Now, uh, this blockchain is stored on a whole host of uh, computers at the same time, and not a single one of them is actually in charge. Everybody has their own copy of this blockchain. <coughs> so what we have to do is have some kind of a mechanism with, uh, which regulates who gets to be in charge temporarily of the blockchain and who gets to add new blocks to the blockchain. So you can see here there's this little lottery ticket here. Right? That's a winning lottery ticket that one of the nodes has produced which shows that they have won the computational lottery that's going on behind the scenes. Now, if you go into our uh, student residences and many other places around the, um, uh, the country now, uh, you will find setups like this. So what is this? This is the little card, this sort of wooden uh, box here, which has six graphics cards mounted on it. Right? And there's a motherboard down there, and there's some big fat power supplies here. Right? And it's really handy if you don't have to pay the electricity bill. Uh, what all of these graphic cards are doing is submitting entries into the great big computational lottery for who's going to become the next node to add the block to the blockchain. Right? And when that's you, you are able to say that you would like to reward yourself with what's called the Coinbase transaction, uh, this is a certain number of uh, tokens that you get for winning this uh, lottery. Now, here you see it says 25 bitcoins. That's actually a bit outdated. At the moment, it's 12 and a half. 
And the way Bitcoin is structured is that reward will keep dropping uh, with time. So there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoins um, uh, issued, right? You'll notice that there are other uh, things in there to prevent a fraud and so on, and for other nodes to be able to know that something fishy is up. For example, there's a timestamp there, right? And if, for example, that's too far in the future, then the other nodes will reject that block as being uh, valid, okay? So you can see that what we have here is a structure that doesn't have a central point of control and is actually protected from uh, fraud and censorship. So I thought what I'd do now is just show you some visualizations of the Bitcoin blockchain done by one of our MSc students, Dan McGinn. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so what you see there is... Uh, well, let me turn the lights down a bit more. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, what you can see there is a map of the world, and you may be able to see lots of little blue dots there. Yeah? Each blue dot there is a node on the Bitcoin network. Right? It is equal, each of those blue dots is equally important to, as all the other little blue dots that you see there. The little bars that you see emanating out of the blue dots, that is the volume of transactions that that particular node is seeing for the first time. And when a node receives a transaction, it then relays that transaction to all the other nodes um, on the map. All sorts of interesting phenomena like a big hole over China. That's not because there's no Bitcoin activity in China. There's masses of it. It's because of the great firewall of China, right? A little bit of activity there in Europe and the US. That activity coming out of the coast of Africa, that's just the failure of the geolocated IPs. That's not like a, a secret island or anything. Um, what's also worth looking at is the so-called memory pool. Um, this, these are the transactions streaming into the current block of the Bitcoin blockchain in real time. These are the transactions coming in, waiting to be uh, approved or validated by the next winner uh, of that uh, computational lottery, right? And what you can see is every uh, transaction here is the, um, a white dot, and then there are two um, colors at work here. There's an orange input to a transaction, and there is a blue uh, output. And uh, what you will find, I'm sorry you can't see the, the, blue, the blue very well here, but trust me that each of these transactions has at least um, uh, two, um, uh, at least one input and at least one output, often two outputs, because the way Bitcoin works is that when you spend your Bitcoin, you spend the entire contents of your wallet, right? And then you take some change. So you can see, for example, here, this is somebody collecting up lots of little bits of Bitcoin and then making a payment out to uh, somebody else here. And it's wonderful because every time you look at this, you see different structures and interesting patterns going uh, uh, on in there. Right, so people often ask, so why would you use a um, blockchain rather than a regular database? And I think this story um, is one of the best uh, kind of... Uh, examples of that that I have um, heard. And there's this organization called the GIA, which is the Gemological Institute of America. And what they do is they grade diamonds. And they have a database which records the details of those diamonds. And they categorize them according to the cut and the color and the clarity and so on and so forth. Um, and then they issue corresponding certificates. Right? Now, what happened was that some contractors got into the database and they changed the record correspond to various diamonds. And instead of, for example, having slight inclusions or, suddenly, uh, or something, suddenly these diamonds became flawless. And instead of being yay big, they were suddenly yay big, right? Um, and this activity went on for almost a full year before anybody realized something was up. 
right? That is not something that would happen with a blockchain because the minute anybody tampered with the data, we would be aware because those hashes between the blocks would be compromised. So there are three things you need in a blockchain. Uh, one is some kind of token of value, some kind of currency. Right? And that is what you use to reward the people who are providing the computing power, which is guaranteeing the integrity of the data in that system. You need the ledger of transactions, the actual blocks themselves. Right? And then you need some kind of consensus mechanism by which all the different nodes in the system come to agree on what is the current de facto state of that particular system. And that's called the consensus mechanism. And the mechanism that I've been talking about, because it happens to be the uh, mechanism that's used in both in uh, Bitcoin and also Ethereum, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, is called proof of work. But there are other uh, consensus mechanisms. So the two most popular uh, blockchain platforms out there at the moment the so-called public and permissionless ones, which anyone is allowed to take part in and anyone can submit transactions to and anyone can inspect the state of the blockchain, uh, they are uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Now, Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency sort of uh, emanated out of a paper sort of published anonymously on the Internet. Uh, ironically, the sort of paper that would never make it into any research evaluation uh, exercise, right, conducted uh, uh, every six years or so. Um, but but uh, what Bitcoin specializes in is moving value around between wallets, right? So you have, uh, uh, you have wallets and you can move Bitcoins, you can move these tokens of value between them, and that's pretty much all Bitcoin is designed to do. Uh, Ethereum is what's called a smart contracts platform. It is designed to, with a much more lofty ambition in mind. It wants to be a general purpose distributed computer. And the idea is that transactions in Ethereum, they can be, if you want, a simple transfer of value from uh, one person or one wallet to another. Uh, but they can also be uh, governed by what are called smart contracts. Essentially programmable movements of money that depend on all sorts of uh, uh, conditions. Okay, so I like to talk about Bitcoin as being the Microsoft Excel of this world. It's kind of just like a spreadsheet, just records transactions, whereas Ethereum is a more general purpose computing platform. So now I would like to talk about some of the applications that we've put this technology to. And I'm going to start with something called uh, GradBase, which is all about academic qualifications. And you might think, well, how does this relate to, to Bitcoin, which is all about the movement of value, right? And the whole idea is, well, a transaction in a blockchain doesn't necessarily have to relate to something financial. Why can't, for example, a transaction in a blockchain correspond to a university conferring a qualification onto a particular individual? Right? And we've designed such a system. It's called GradBase. And uh, this is um, roughly the idea, is that you have transactions which actually go at the moment to the Bitcoin blockchain. They're issued from the university yeah, at, from a public wallet address that is known to be the university's address to what we call the qualification address, which encodes somehow the details of the award of a particular degree to a uh, particular student. Right? And you can see the amount of uh, the transaction is very, very small. Right? We send 0. 0.00006 um, bitcoins. But it's not the amount that's significant. It's the fact that that transaction exists and it's been issued by uh, the wallet of the university that counts. Okay? And what, is this, what does this mean we can do? Well, it means that in future people's CVs might look like this. Right? Here we have Sam Bennett. He went to Cardiff. Uh, he went to Imperial. Um, he did a B engine computing. He got a 2.1, which is very good. And he, from Cardiff, he got this M, uh, 
uh, masters in, in, in management and in past that. That was great. Right? Now, you may be wondering what are these strange QR codes there? Well, if we zoom in on them and say we zoom in on the Imperial one just because this is Friends of Imperial, right? Uh, there it is. Now, how many of you, if you've got a smartphone, can you take it out? And if you've got yourselves a QR code reader or a scanner, can you scan that and see what happens? Okay, this is a big experiment. If you can maybe just put your hand up or shut up when you've got it working. Yeah, somebody's got it working. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So verifying somebody's qualification is normally something that requires you to pay 60 pounds and wait two weeks for. And hopefully, you've just been able to do that pretty much instantly, right? So what the people with smartphones uh, uh, that, that are scanning that are, are, are being taken to is a page that looks like this, yeah? to say that this degree has been verified as being genuine and there's a corresponding transaction in the Bitcoin blockchain uh, corresponding to the issue of that degree uh, to that student. And it doesn't just encode the fact that the student's been issued with a degree. It's all those other details, including the things people love to fib about, like the exact degree classification and so on. Right? You always know when people say, I studied at X, Y, Z, the outcome was somewhat in doubt. Right. Now, this kind of system turns out to be better for students because they can go into an interview and they know they will stand out as being the instantly credible candidates with the qualifications that can be uh, instantly verified. It's better for companies because they don't have to pay 60 pounds and wait two weeks to find out if somebody has the qualifications they claim. And it's better for universities because we can hopefully uh, stop uh, uh, paying for um, people to spend all of their time trawling around spreadsheets looking to see if somebody does actually have a degree from the college. Right? There's no reason why this has to be a manual um, activity. Something else, some other area where this technology really helps is in supply chains. So you're probably all familiar with the horse meat scandal <laughs> and you'd like to know that the burger you're eating is, not an, is in fact beef and not uh, horse, right? Um, also, there are a large number of people who care about which of these is the genuine Gucci handbag. I've actually forgotten, I think. <laughs> I think it's the one on the right. You can check that out yourselves. I don't know. Maybe someone can tell. Um, so what we did is we, did, we built a system based on blockchain technology and also uh, secure near-field communication. There's little tags you can put on uh, products and scan with um, a, 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 a mobile phone, for example. Right? And the way it works is that uh, you have your supply chain and every stage, every time a product moves along the supply chain, two things happen. One, a transaction goes into a blockchain to record that movement. And two, the tag on the product is updated to reflect its current um, stage of movement. Right? Uh, by the time the product gets to the customer, it's on the supermarket shelf, it has a little tag on it. Uh, consumers can download an app, they can tap it on the tag. Right? So here we are in Waitrose, we've picked up the sandwich, we're gonna tap our phone um, on the product, and we see indeed this is a ham sandwich, carefully chosen because it has just two ingredients, bread and ham. <coughs> Probably a few preservatives and other things we haven't listed. Um, and when I click on, for example, the bread, I can be taken back into the history and, and, and see the provenance of that particular uh, ingredient. Right? Um, it gets really interesting when you think about what use would this technology be to, for example, a regulator who would suddenly be able to see all of the different ingredients going into a product. And if this app also let people report, say, problems, um, for example, maybe they felt ill after eating a particular sandwich or salad or whatever, then that could, information could be easily cross-referenced so that we could find out either the ingredient that was causing the problem or the location of the processing that was causing the problem. And you could just dispatch the inspectors to go and uh, do their stuff. Um, 
a lot of manufacturers out there have also latched onto this problem. Um, I just wanted to ask, has anyone here had the problem that someone else has falsely claimed ownership of their shoes? <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. I thought that was a bit of a suspicious motivation, right? Um, however, this issue here of counterfeiting of major brands is a really big issue. And so what manufacturers are doing these days, so this is a Reebok major uh, sneaker, and it comes now with a special tag from a company called Chronicled, um, which gives this unique product uh, fingerprint, which has actually been encoded on the Ethereum uh, blockchain. So it's a very similar kind of system to the one that we have uh, developed. Right? There's also a local company called Provenance. It's a social enterprise which does some very interesting uh, research in this area as well. Uh, another thing that we've been looking at is how can we apply smart contract uh, technology in government. So governments, as you may be aware, are really under big pressure these days. They have to deliver uh, services, particularly local government services, at much lower cost, and yet they would like to do it in a way that increases the participation of citizens, uh, is more collaborative, and much more transparent. Right? They call this idea government 2.0. And we've done a little case study where we've looked at how can this be applied to, for example, the delivery of waste management services in local authorities. And that's bin collection. Um, this is what it looks like to uh, users uh, of the system. And there are interfaces both for uh, the council and for um, citizens and for contractors, right? And this is what's going on uh, behind the scenes. So we've got the usual stakeholders we would expect, the council, the local residents, the contractors. They are all interacting around a system of smart contracts recorded in the blockchain. And what those smart contracts are doing is checking on the current status of the service and how it's been delivered, right? Looking at all the KPIs. And if the KPIs are being met, then it will automatically pay out on those contracts, and if the KPIs are not being met, it will uh, issue the corresponding penalties automatically. You will notice there's also a new kind of actor in this system, yeah? There's a smart bin. It's got a sensor that can detect when it's been collected, or even uh, if it gets full, it can alert the contractor that it's full and needs to be picked up. Now, you can imagine this even leading to new kinds of business models where instead of having just one contractor to do the waste collection, you could have three. And these contractors could receive these alerts, and the first one to get the bin gets the payment, <laughs> right? You then need some mechanism for regulating the fight that breaks out amongst the contractors <laughs> when they arrive at the bin, right? Maybe you can think of something more sophisticated, like it does round robin, and if it hasn't been picked up within 10 minutes, then the other contractors get get the dibs on that, right? Um, so I think this is a lot of fun, and I think it does achieve the goals it sets out, right? So local residents get to, for example, vote and supply evidence of whether they uh, perceive the contract as being efficiently executed or not. So if you see a pile of rubbish lying around in the street, that is some evidence that you can upload that gets recorded in the blockchain and gets taken into account uh, when it's decided if this service provider is doing a good job or not. Right? The council instantly gets a, a, an overview of what the real-time um, service being provided is, as does the uh, contractor. Smart contracts come with their own problems, and he's uh, absolutely right. Uh, there have been a number of incidents uh, recently. If you keep up in this, the news in this space, you'll be aware of them. Um, Probably the biggest uh, example of things going wrong with smart contracts is something called the Decentralized Autonomous Organization, or the DAO. This was the world's first company set up as some smart contracts to run on the Ethereum uh, blockchain. Uh, this was supposed to be the template for the way all, current, uh, all companies will run uh, in the future as sets of contracts on a blockchain, right? And they 
the idea was that this essentially was going to be an investor-directed venture fund. And I think they anticipated raising about $10 million worth of uh, capital for it. In the event they had a token sale, right, they, um, they raised actually $150 million uh, worth of capital in just 28 days. People thought this was fantastic. And if you went to their website and you had a look at it, it was going to be brilliant, right? The Dow is rewarding. There's even a little chart here which is kind of implying that it's just going up and taking off, right? Um, I think that some other people were a little bit more, more skeptical and a little bit more hesitant about rushing um, into what was essentially a completely... Uh, untested and untried experiment, right? And it's quite interesting where suddenly the experiments that are you doing are involving 150 million pounds of other people's money, right? And those people have lawyers and things who will get angry at you if things go wrong. And in fact, what happened was a third of this money got stolen thanks to a smart contract coding area. Uh, error, right? So everybody knows that if you are writing software that controls the movement of money and you have to move money from uh, one account to another, it's a good idea to deduct the balance of the sender before you credit the receiver. Somebody didn't know that and they were responsible for writing the contract that spun out a new venture. And somebody found a way of getting the contract to call itself again after the receiver had been credited, but before the sender had been debited. And if you look here, here's a trace of the kind of transactions that were going on at the time. Um, so the amount of money that was being sent is this 258 ether, and it was supposed to be a one-sort. But by calling this contract again and again without ever having the balance debited, you can see that in this very second here, this person got very, very rich, bearing in mind that at this point, one ether was worth about 20 US dollars. Yeah, so in the, in the end, there was 3.6 million ether sitting in an account and essentially people now started having a big debate, right? Um, besides this, obviously. <laughs> um, and people, the debate people were having is the following. Okay, is this a crime? Is this not a crime? We've got a real problem here because very angry people who've invested large amounts of real money in this thought they were signing up to one kind of contract and the code has kind of gone wrong and executed some other kind of contract. And now somebody is sitting on 3.6 million uh, ether, which they arguably don't deserve. Although other people say, of course they deserve it. The code is the law. They legitimately exploited a loophole in the system. The people who lost their money should be very grateful at such a cheap lesson. <laughs> right? Now, actually, most of the community decided that's probably not an acceptable way to proceed. But there was a real split on the issue, right? And actually, what's happened is that the currency has done what they call a fork. And half of the community have decided to go ahead and exist in a universe where the crime has been backed out and the effects of the theft has been reversed, and that's the Ethereum blockchain as you'll know it today. And others of the community have decided to carry on with something called Ethereum Classic, keep building the old Ethereum blockchain, right? And in this universe, the theft hasn't been reversed. And of course, this has created total pandemonium and chaos, because you can imagine now, what do people do? One morning, they're holding Ethereum, they wake up the following day and they have both some Ethereum and some Ethereum Classic. What's worse is because all the private keys are the same on these two blockchains, you suddenly have replay attacks whereby somebody making a transaction on, say, the Ethereum uh, Classic blockchain can replay it on the Ethereum blockchain and vice versa. Right? 
total chaos. And people were uh, milking exchanges and stuff in various little scams involving repeated replay attacks for a while until the, the exchanges woke up to the fact that they were um, being, being done in this, in, in this way. Uh, but to my mind, this is a very bad way to deal with uh, essentially what is a governance issue that turns up, right? Um, it is, can't be the right thing every time there's a major dispute or argument for the blockchain to fork and for everybody to receive new tokens in the two different universes um, that could then possibly result. Because how many different currencies are we going to end up with after the fourth argument? Yeah? Also, the way that this um, kind of uh, dispute was resolved was a little bit strange because essentially the people who got to do the voting are the people providing the, miner, the mining power. So essentially we have kind of a democracy by graphics card. <laughs> yeah, a graphicocracy, I guess you would call it. Yeah. Is that really right? Should the people with the most graphics cards be the ones deciding on uh, what's right and wrong in the world? Yeah, this is kind of one of the issues we're trying to deal with as a research issue in the center uh, right now, and we're trying to come up with much better governance mechanisms than that. Um, there are other problems with um, smart contracts. It's not just logical errors in um, the smart contracts. Because these systems are so powerful, uh, they have what is called a very large um, uh, attack surface. There's lots of different ways you can try and meddle with Ethereum because it is so powerful and there is so much you can try. Uh, with Bitcoin, because it's so much simpler and so much more focused, it's a lot harder to mess with. Uh, right. So here is, for example, a smart contract that was launched on the eve of DevCon 2, which is the major uh, developer contract um, that the Ethereum community holds. And you can see here in German, it says here, go home. And the result of this smart contract running on people's Ethereum nodes um, is the following. Yeah? The major client, the Go Ethereum uh, uh, clients, they all fell over due to an out of memory error, wiping out a substantial portion of the mining power um, in an instant, thanks to just this one particular contract. All right? Uh, we've seen lots of uh, similar attacks since. Here is somebody spamming the system with lots of tiny uh, contracts for tiny amounts of, uh, of value. So a way is like a tiny fraction of uh, 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 an ether. And just trying to spam the system with lots of these. Uh, here's another one, uh, which is a, 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 a more recent one again. I noticed the other day the temperature on my... Um, little network attached storage box which runs an Ethereum virtual machine was soaring and it was kind of churning and chugging away. Uh, and, and I kind of looked into what was going on um, and I discovered somebody was issuing a whole load of contracts which had very expensive operations in them. Particularly there's this thing called uh, Xcode size here. Yeah. This apparently... Um, you can see how many steps there are in this transaction, like 986,000. Right? So these contracts were issuing lots of these things which use A, a lot of memory, and B, access the disk a lot. Right? So all that churning and increased temperature of my NAS box was all down to this kind of uh, contract. And this kind of stuff is still ongoing even right now as we speak. But the good thing is the Ethereum community is very good at patching these um, problems. And, and issuing um, updates to the software. So a couple of days ago, I woke up, and actually the, the node had fallen over. It had just dumped, and there'd been some kind of fatal error. Uh, just downloaded the updated software, ran it, and it's up and happy again. Yeah, but there are a lot of people trying to seriously attack this system um, quite hard right now. I think it's very good, because it actually increases the resilience of the, uh, of the software. Right, other things we're interested in, um, the Internet of Things. So they say in the future, all the devices in your home will be doing business on your behalf. And there's a great cartoon 
of various devices in somebody's kitchen demanding various ransoms um, <laughs> before they will do their task. Like the door says, you must pay me 20 Bitcoin or I won't open, yeah? You want to go outside? Well, <laughs> um, we're interested in healthcare applications, and this is a particular interest, as I said, of uh, uh, Rob Lerney. And we're also engaging with the um, research agenda of the Bank of England, which is all about what would we do uh, if we could issue digital tokens that were the equivalents of the pounds in our pockets, right? And actually, there are some companies out there, as I learned at the London <laughs> Ethereum meetup the other day, which is something that we also hold, uh, uh, host occasionally. Um, there's a company called Tremonex, which is actually planning on issuing tokens which are backed by pounds. So they're not going to wait for the central bank to do it. They're just going to go ahead and, and, and do it themselves. So that's, that's a really exciting development. Um, yeah, we're, uh, you may also have seen this uh, report which came out of the uh, government. Um, that was co-authored by uh, Kathy Mulligan, one of my uh, co-directors. Now, this is the kind of field that one person cannot get their head around or deal with, and we've been incredibly fortunate to work with a lot of very talented students who have uh, done projects um, in this area, a lot, and PhD, have uh, started doing PhDs and so on in this area. A lot of uh, researchers, in uh, both from computing and from other departments like uh, the business school, uh, we've had fantastic interactions with all sorts of different parts of uh, Imperial College, uh, including executive education, corporate partnerships, our media division, uh, the archives, and, and, and so on. Um, and I would also just say that we are very blessed in this college at having a senior uh, leadership who are really um, inspiring and who really get uh, what doing uh, research is about, particularly at faculty level, Jeff McGee, and, uh, of course, our president, uh, Alice Gast. Right? She's always standing up and telling us to be courageous and bold and to go out there and try new things, and, 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 and that's, that's nice. Um, there are also a lot of companies and a lot of people from government uh, that we have worked with, and here are just um, some of them, and we're very grateful to them all for the uh, interactions that we have had and continue to uh, enjoy. And just a final thing, a little plug for what is now called the Imperial Blockchain Forum. Our next meeting is going to be on Monday, 24th of October, in Lecture Theatre 308 in the uh, Huxley Building, which is the Computer Science Building, on the Queensgate side of um, uh, college. It's an open event. Uh, you're all welcome uh, to that.